So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us and making time to be with us for this really interesting talk from our specialist hand plastic and reconstructive surgeon, Dr. Yasanta Rajapax. He's been with us for almost a year now, and we are very, very lucky to have him with us in MAG. He is a scarring and hand expert, and his reports are excellent. We really like working with him. Um, he's very sought after in his private and clinical practice as well. Um, so without further ado, I, I will hand over, but first asking if you would please mute your microphone so that sound in your home or office does not disturb the recording. And also, if you have any questions, please wait until after the session for any questions, or you can put them in the um, chat module. Um, <clears throat> you will be being sent the recording a day or two after this. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rajapax. Over to you. Thank you, Michelle, for introducing me. Um, and. Um... I will start my presentation now. Great, I can see that. Good. Just want to make sure that's all, all good to go. Oops. Okay. Right. Michelle kindly introduced me. My name is Dr. Yassandra Rajpaxi. I'm a plastic reconstructive and hand surgeon. And today I'm gonna to be talking about a general talk about plastic surgery principles and skin and scarring as it pertains to plastic surgery. Right, so we'll get ahead. So as an overview, this talk is gonna first of all, start off with plastic surgery split principles and what we do in plastic surgery is I thought that'd be quite useful for members of the audience who are not familiar with our reconstructive techniques. And then from there, I wanna tie it into the basics of wound healing because scarring is basically abnormal wound healing. Um, which can result in keloid and hypertrophic scars. Then I want to talk about methods of treatment for these keloid and hypertrophic scars. And then we'll follow with scar revisions, particularly pertaining to contractures. And then finally, I want to tie it all together with bringing in a medical legal perspective for skin and scarring. So plastic surgery, what is plastic surgery? Well, plastic surgery is derived from the Greek word plastikos, which means to form or mold. And as, a re as reconstructive principles, we aim to correct the deformity. And when we think about a deformity, we think about it as in form and function. Now, how do we do this? Well, we rely on the body's innate ability to heal. We look at the body's design, basically resting skin tension lines and lines of maximum elasticity, which I will talk more about as the talk continues. And we use various techniques and tools, which colloquially we term the reconstructive toolbox. Now this slide is an old slide where it kind of depicts a hierarchy. Well, there's no real hierarchy with the reconstructive toolbox. We have anything from our armamentarium of allowing the wound to heal by secondary intention, which means do nothing, to directly closure, which you may be familiar with by suturing. If the defect or wound is too big to suture, a skin graft, following that local tissue transfer, which is also colloquially termed a flap and distant tissue transfer where this flap of tissue is transferred further to free tissue transfer, which is usually pertained by microsurgical reconstruction. Now, as a plastic surgeon, we go to what is appropriate. So if a defect is large enough, I mean, we may go straight to a free tissue transfer because skin closure and a graft won't surface. So this slide here shows you what we tend to employ and use in our techniques to get good scarring and skin closure. Everybody has got skin tension lines, which become more pronounced as we get older, as commonly seen in the face with wrinkles, but the body has wrinkles all over is the natural relaxed skin tension lines. 
Now, you make an incision with wound healing, you're going to get a scar. There's no such thing as scarless surgery unless you have fetal in utero surgery. And the, the whole key, what we do as plastic surgeons is try to employ techniques to hide the scars or minimize the scarring effect. Now, again, this example shows you simple excisions and closures that what you'd see in, in a skin cancer resection. And again, the design, the geometric design of the ellipses you can see are formed in the lines of the natural skin tension lines. And for certain structures which are at edges, we use techniques like a wedge excision for a nose, eyelid, ear, which again gives good, accurate apposition. Because as you'll see when I talk further on, to get good scarring and avoid the, the adverse scarring effects of hypertrophic or keloid scarring, we, it's wound apposition is critical. And I'll talk more about that as we go on, but the main types of skin closures we use are simple interrupted sutures, vertical or horizontal mattresses, or running sutures, which can be over or a subcuticular which is where they usually employed with the dissolvent stitches. But again, the key for good scarring is an accurate wound with the wound edges approximated closely. Now, again, this is another example of geometric design of a wedge, the eyelid, and using the, the triangular wedge to get good apposition. So moving along from simple direct closure, if a wound is too big to be closed, we can sometimes use skin grafts. Now, what is a graft? Well, a graft is, can be either full thickness or split thickness, depending on the thickness of the dermis involved. Now, a graft does not in, involve any blood tissue, blood vessels, or any, any fatty tissue. Now, a split thickness skin graft can be thin to thick, depending on its variation of dermis that's taken with the graft. Now, the key thing I want to emphasize is that a skin graft does not have a blood supply. It relies completely on the recipient bed. So here you can see a thin split thickness skin graft, the typical donor site we see. Now, grafts historically were, were harvested with what we call a humby knife or a skin graft knife, which still are employed today. But for larger areas, especially in burn surgery, we tend to use an electric or air powered dermatome, which is a a machine that we use to harvest. Now, this is a practical example of a lesion on the scalp. It's quite large. It, it has been surfaced by a skin graft, which you can see on the photo on the right. Now, again, this graft relies on the blood supply of the surrounding tissue to revascularize and make this graft take or survive. Now, any kind of graft, uh, uh, a split thickness skin graft or a full thickness skin graft will have a contracture or has the ability to contract because of the collagen and fibrin in the dermal matrix. So we have to expect that and depending on, on the type of graft, whether it's a split thickness or a full thickness, they can get early or late contractures. Now, how does a graft take? Well, it relies on its donor blood supply and it the, these are technical terms, imbibation, inoculation, and revascularization. But basically, you put the graft on, it sticks or glues onto the, uh, onto the, the donor recipient site, call that adherence, and then there's diffusion of nutrients, and eventually blood vessels grow, and we get revascularization and an incorporated graft. Grafts tend to fail because if something gets in between the donor site and the, and the skin graft, which can either be infection, which is why we try to have a clean, healthy bed. We avoid fluid buildups such as seromas or any blood. So we want a blood vessel field uh, ideally. We also tend to secure them, depending on the size of the graft, by foam or staples or a tie over dressing, as this picture depicts a full thickness skin graft. So this example here shows the full thickness skin graft and where the donor graft is taken from the back of the ear or the, the upper neck area or supraclavicular area. And the donor site ideally will be directly closed to minimize a secondary defect. Now, what is a flap? Well, as opposed to a skin graft, 
a flap has its own blood supply. And this is especially useful over bone, tendon, and ligaments. And as I mentioned, skin grafts are not are very useful and versatile, but they're not the panacea for every kind of closure because it relies on its donor site blood supply. So on avascular tissue, such as bone, bare bone, tendon, or ligaments, putting a skin graft on these tissues, there isn't much blood supply in the bone itself. So the graft will usually not incorporate. And this is why a flap comes into its own because it brings its own blood supply. And flaps can be classified as a, either skin, fascia, muscle, depending on the tissue supplied. This classification of flaps, this is just a, a slide which kind of shows you and depicts that the flap of tissue here has got some sort of blood supply. And depending on whether it's a named vessel, depends on whether it's a local flap or a regional flap, which I will talk about very shortly. So local flaps usually are flaps with skin, epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous fat with, with blood vessels in it. And the local flaps tend to be adjacent to the defect, usually for smaller defects, so with, not with exact named arteries, such as small flaps from the face and the, uh, or, 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 or the, or the tr torso or trunk. And these flaps are basically divided into two types of flaps, an advancement flap, where the flap is extended or a rotation flap about a pivot point, which can be a true rotation flap, a transposition, or we call it interpolation inter flap, where part of the pedicle is hidden under a bridge of skin. So here we see the basic geometrical principles of a rotation flap. There's a line of pivot point and a line of greatest tension as we bring the, uh, the tissue to, to come forward and fill the defect. Now, as I said, in the principles of plastic surgery, it's basically Robin Peter to pay Paul. We don't invent tissue unless we are actually trying to do something, another procedure, which I'm not going to talk about in this talk, such as tissue expansion. But we, we utilize tissue that's redundant in one part to fill a defect in, in tissue that's deficient in another part. And that's the basis of any kind of flap surgery of local or regional. So here's a classic example. We've got a defect or lesion in this case over the lateral up outer eyebrow. And you can see a rotation flap fashioned based on the existing lax tissue in the surrounding nape and its blood supply to close the defect. Transposition flaps again are a variation of rotation flaps where they tend to be more rectangular piece of tissue and it again rotates around a, a pivot point. Sometimes you, we use little techniques like back cuts to further facilitate motion. And you can see here, there's the defects. We've, we've rotated skin across, but in order to bring this skin across, you see in the lower diagram, we've utilized excess tissue that's easily missed in the, in the posterior ear and neck area to bring that forward to make a tensionless closure. Because to get good scarring, we wanna have a clean wound bed, but tensionless closures. Here's another example of transposition flaps, banner flaps, or advancement flaps. So we call this one a, um, a bilobe flap in the middle. And I get another type of flap, a nasolabial flap, which is a transposition flap to correct a one centimeter defect in the upper lip. So these transposition flaps are commonly for small ones are, are um, described as rhomboid or limber flaps. And again, using loose tissue and using the, the tissue that's available to close the defect so that you can close the secondary defect without another defect of tissue. And again, like this slide shows you with the lines of maximum elasticity and the rest intention lines, we can incorporate a flap to cover a defect, which then will hopefully heal well because the majority of the scars are placed in the resting tension lines. And here we see an advancement flap, another advancement flap, and various variations for closure. Now, given an a more practical example, you can see that we can re reconstruct quite large defects using these techniques such as transposition, transposition flaps to reconstruct a lip. And in this situation, we would want to hopefully harvest 
the flap with its nerve and blood supply so that we can get a functional result. So what are regional flaps? So regional flaps tend to be larger, larger skin flaps, sorry, uh, larger flaps with their own blood supply, which can be skin, fascia, or muscle. This is, this is a slide showing different types of muscle flaps and their classification, which is beyond the scope of this talk, but it gives an idea of big muscles that we can use or large areas of tissue. Now, again, with the principles of Robin Peter to pay Paul, we want to make sure that our donor muscle is not missed. So it tends to be muscles that are more redundant than useful um, to avoid donor site morbidity. Now, in some cases that may not be possible, and this is an older slide for a breast reconstruction, but it gives the principle of we're using a regional muscle, which is the transrectus abdominis muscle, and with the adjacent tissue, and we use that and we tunnel that to create a, a new breast. Now, this again, as I said, is historical because in the last 20 years, we, or last 30 years, we've gone to more free mu muscle reconstruction or free flap reconstruction where we use microsurgery to reconstruct the defect. And we, have, we find this even further in the last 10 to 15 years with perforator based surgery. So in, a, in, in this example, we wouldn't be doing this for a breast reconstruction these days. We would use the perforator based on the vessel that supplies the, the rectus abdominis muscle to create a new breast. So a regional flap, this example shows you that we've used tissue from the delta pectoral area or the upper chest and with its own blood supply from the perforated internal memory arteries to reconstruct the defect over vital structures, in this case, the larynx. Now you can see that this creates a, a secondary defect and that's why we've had to resurface that with a full thickness skin graft. So what is a free tissue transfer? Well, a free tissue transfer, uh, as mentioned, has now become the mainstay of a lot of, lot of large um, plastic surgery reconstructions for large defects, especially covering areas that won't respond with skin grafts or flap or, or local flaps. And what's employed here, this is an example of an anterolateral thigh flap. Again, we're using named vessels or their perforating branches and parts of skin and we use an operating microscope and we re-anastomose that flap, which is a tissue with a blood supply to a recipient bed. In this picture, you can see the tissue taken from the side of the thigh, which has now been used to cover a defect on the, on the dorsum of the foot. This is a real life picture, which shows a, a, a defect following a road accident actually. And you can see there's exposed, there's exposed bone, there's metal wear in there, which you can't see. And we're using muscle from the inner thigh and that's harvested and using an operating microscope, we've been able to reattach it to the, so that the tissue has now got a new blood supply. And if it's a muscle, in this case, we put a skin graft over that to get a functional covering so we can rehabilitate and start mobilization. Here's another example of using a free flap situation for a large defect um, in, the, in the neck. And we've taken tissue from the forearm and that's the resulting defect, which is healed and incorporated well. So that is an overview of reconstruction very briefly in, um, and techniques we employ in plastic surgery. So now I'm trying to tie this in with skin and scarring. Well, any kind of reconstruction we, want, we aim to get good scarring. And as I mentioned, we want to have a clean wound bed and we want to have a um, good opposition of skin. Now, one of the fundamentals of understanding scarring is first of all, understand wound healing, because as you make any incision or any trauma, in order for the wound to heal, there will be resultant scar. So types of wound healing, we've got primary wound healing, where the classic surgical excision and direct closure wound edges are directly reapproximated. We've got then delayed primary healing. This is more in a contaminated wound where we want to let a clean wound bed um, arise before we start any closure. So after a few days, then certain wounds 
may actually heal better by the natural contracture process of healing. And these wounds we call healing by secondary intention. And then partial thickness wounds, again, a form of secondary intention with just the epithelial layer, we let that uh, re-epithelialize and there's usually minimal contracture because it hasn't involved the dermis. So you probably get better results than trying to cut it out and close it. So wound healing, Again, the, the, the steps are adherence or coagulation of platelets. We get an early and late inflammatory response. And then we get migration of the fibroblasts, which are the connective tissue cells that help support the structure, followed by blood vessel formation and remodeling. Now, it's in the latter part, this angiogenesis, epithelialization and remodeling that we get potentially abnormal wound healing and can result in an ugly scar. This is a slide that just shows you the, that, that initial acute inflammatory phase and what types of cells are involved. So get in part to the next part of my talk, abnormalities in wound healing, which lead to excessive wound healing and bad scars can be divided primarily into two types of scars, keloid and hypertrophic. Now, the key difference for, to to really just understand the distincting point between a keloid scar and a hypertrophic scar is that a keloid scar extends beyond the original scar margins. Whereas a hypertrophic scar usually remains within the border of the original scar. They're much more common in darker skinned people and they both can be very troublesome and, and, uh, and need adequate treatment. The other main problem with wound healing can be inadequate wound healing, where we get lack of resistance to the healing mechanism and poor wound healing, such as in certain, certain um, conditions that people suffer from, such as diabetes, where the diabetic wounds tend, tend not to heal well and you can get the classic diabetic ulcer. We're also cautious with any kind of surgery in, di in poorly controlled diabetes, diabetics for that for the same reason. Environmental factors can also be um, uh, an, an issue. This is more historical, but back in the days when people were seafarers, Lack of vitamin C caused scurvy and, and also led to lots of wound problems. Drugs as well can cause wound healing problems as, as frequented by patients that are on long-term steroids or on certain cancer, anti-cancer chemotherapy drugs. So a hypertrophic scar, what is it? It's a raised erythematous scar, similar to a keloid in, in that sense, but within the confines of the original wound. Symptomatically, they can be itchiness. It usually appears early and usually they improve with time. It's again, an overproduction of all the scar components, the thick haphazard collagen bundles. And as I mentioned previously in my talk, predisposing factors which we wanna try and minimize with our surgical technique are delayed healing, poor wound in, 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 in infections and increased inflammation. So this is a hypertrophic scar. You can see it, it has not extended beyond its margin, but it's thickened, it's raised, it's um, hyperpigmented. Burn scars, unfortunately, sometimes can, be, can result in hypertrophic scarring if, if they're not adequately treated. This shows this poor young child on the right, which you can see oversensitive and functional areas like the axilla can be disastrous and result in a contracture. So keloid scarring. Well, keloid scars have been described as far back as the ancient Egyptian times. And in the 1800s, described it as a shaloid or a crab claw because it spreads. And it was, no, it was noted at that time that this is a scar that spreads outside the original wound. And it's like a hypertrophic scar, it's raised, um, but it doesn't regress spontaneously or potentially can regress like a hypertrophic scar. And it proliferates beyond the wound margins. So you can see here, on this vertical scar, it's extended from its original site in the inferior aspect of the photo. Both scars arise secondary to cutaneous injury and are increasing susceptibility with African people of African descent or darker skin. They are, it's multifactorial and there are certain genetic factors and hereditary factors, though definitive proof has not really been shown. This is we can try and minimize these by trying to place scars uh, along the lines of tension, I suppose they're against the tension lines. 
There are certain areas of the body which are more susceptible, such as the pre-sternal, the back, the proximal upper lip, limbs, or, and the chest and lower face and neck. Keloid scars tend to occur anywhere from weeks to years, whereas hypertrophic scarring usually occurs in the first four weeks. And keloid scars persist where hypertrophic scars can potentially regress over time. So as you can see here, this, this patient has had multiple keloid scars. The original scars were little biopsy puncture sites, and you can see how they've extended and they've got thickened and raised far beyond the actual original injury. Classic keloids tend to occur also following ear piercings, which can sometimes mimic a, a, a tumor. So with keloid and hypertrophic scarring, there tend to be multiple treatment options, ranging from conservative, such as using pressure or silicone, all the way up to radiation, using in complex immunotherapy and pharmacological treatments, as well as the mainstay of surgery and lasers. But the bottom line is, there's generally a poor overall response to treatment, hence many treatments, and they are difficult problems, and the patient needs to be counseled about that. So this is a brief overview of the treatments of keloid scarring. Well, one is silicone, where there's been studies have shown that putting uh, constant low-grade pressure over a wound tends to improve the scarring and also help prevent scarring, adverse scarring. Um, steroids have also been a mainstay the, where they damp down this hyper-inflammatory hyper response. Problems with steroid, long-term steroid use are, in itself, they can cause ulceration, hyperpigmentation, and even atrophy or thinning of the skin. Here you can see that original slide I showed you with the, hyper, with the, with the keloid scar, and you can see in the superior part of the scar, you, you can notice the difference and that's been injected with steroid trimacillin. And because of the dosing and side effects, we tend to do this episodically, usually at least three to four times over a six week interval at each time. And you can see here, there's the hypotrophy, that there's actually a keloid here. And you can see it sort of improve over sequential, this is six weeks apart in each slide. Lasers have also been described and they can vary from what we call ablative carbon dioxide lasers to uh, ND YAG or pulse style lasers. And this is, these are useful for large areas where you can't um, steroid the whole area for fear of toxicity. And you can see the burn scar here. Still not ideal on the right, but it's improved considerably. Cryotherapy or freezing has also been shown to be um, an, a useful adjunct but they tend to be more useful in combination with laser or surgery. Now, surgery is, all, is a mainstay, but you've got to be very cautious because by re-excising the scar and re-suturing it, you could potentially create another keloid. So what has been usually um, very effective is combining surgery with either steroid injection or post-operative radiotherapy immediately afterwards to try and minimize that occurrence. So that was keloid and hypertrophic scarring in a nutshell. Now, scar revisions. Well, scar revisions can be very useful, especially if excess or excess scarring over certain functional areas, such as the axilla and the neck, which re re result in contractures. So what scars and, and you are, are useful to revise? Well, unsat any unsatisfactory scar, scars are affecting functions, as mentioned, the auxiliary webbing, hand scarring, which prevent function, because we're all about form and function, anesthetic, anesthetic traumatic scars. So these scars, you know, are raised, they look uh, hypertrophic, they, they look uh, with poor con contour, and, as a, and usually these are as a result of anti-tension line scarring. So the original scars have not been placed in the natural tension lines of the, of the face or body or there's been delayed wound healing. So anesthetic surgery cause scars can also be as a result of dog ears where you've inappropriately planned or, or not. It just could be just the, the way the wound was, that there's a, a tissue mismatch on one side to the other and you end up with what we call dog ears or egg, which are excess, excessive parts of, of, of tissue, which again need to be revised to the later stage. 
So what scars are, are best not to revise? Well, scars in periods of marked growth, uh, where you know it's going to change very shortly, adolescence, in certain circumstances, where there's nearby inflammation, you want to get rid of that beforehand. Beware of certain anatomic locations. And also stretch scars, because there could be underlying fat and subcutaneous tissue loss, which may result in further poor healing. And also, as mentioned, you need to be careful of anybody that's got a predisposition for keloid and hypertrophic scarring. So what are the methods of scar revision? Well, we can excise and close it, a fusiform scar revision. Again, with the principles of meticulous wound, edge closure, and a clean, healthy bed. Or z plasty or w plasty, which I'll talk a little bit about following. And dermabrasion, where we use a technique, we can use a, an instrument or dermabrader to try and flatten the scar. So scar revisions are usually, as I said, a fusiform, you excise the scar, minimize handling of tissue, careful closure of any dead space in layers, and avoid non-reactive suture materials that are absorbable stitches, which can potentially generate an inflammatory reaction. So what is a Z-plasty? Well, a Z-plasty is where we're using ge the geometrical design of the flaps to lengthen a scar and break up a scar. As you can see here, if this was a scar, we're moving normal pieces of tissue to try and break up that, that scar. This is a, a multiple Z plasty in the old slide, not taken from a book, but you can get, you get the idea in a contracture here, where again, using Robin Peter to pay Paul, using laxity around the surrounding sites to bring two Z plasties to break up that scar and release the contracture. The W plasty is similar on similar lines, used to camouflage um, scars, particularly on the face. And it allows the natural expansion and contracture of the scar and maybe level, a uh, leveling effect if there's a contour or, or even height discrepancy between the two sides of the scar. But it's not for certain structures, such as the eyelid or above the eyebrow. And this is an, a, a pictorial diagram of what a W plus is. You've got your scar here and you want to break it up so that the scar fits into the natural tension lines. You can see here, again, another historical slide from a book a rather uns unsightly, unesthetically pleasing scar in the lower cheek. And this is broken down. It seems to have lengthened the scar, but hopefully with the, the arrows pointing, in, it's in more in the natural thin tension line. So as it heals and fades with time, you will get a better aesthetic result. So scars also, we were, in order to assess a scar, we usually have to wait till the scar is fully healed and a scar won't mature until at least 18 to 24 months and that's very important when you're dealing with somebody from a from a treating perspective and also from a medical legal perspective and finally what i'd like to do is bring this all together from talking about plastic surgery skin and scarring and how it applies from a medical legal perspective so using the ama5 we use table 8.2, which is on page 178, or AMA 4, chapter 13, table 2, page 280. Now, both these tables are essentially identical, and they are five different classes from 0 to 9%, 10 to 24, 25 to 54, 55 to 84, and 85 to 95. The majority of scarring from a plastic surgery point of view or surgical point of view tends to fall in the class one, class two, whereas it's more the generalized dermatological disorders which affect the whole body that affect the latter classes. Now, this table is basically broken into three parts, the signs and symptoms, and the activities of daily living and, with, and the treatment required. And the signs and symptoms range from intermittent to constant. The activities of daily living range from none to some to many to most. And treatment ranges from no treatment to intermittent to constant treatment. So each of those three variables and the gradings all help us categorize which class we're going to put them in. Again, we employ the techniques of scar description. As I mentioned, what can cause a bad scar in this talk, useful categorizing is scar signs and symptoms as the descriptors from the tables. And that's based on the anatomic location, the size, the shape, the color, the texture 
whether they're hypertrophic or atrophic, or whether there's an attachment or adhesion to bone, joint, or muscle, and ulceration. Now, using the tables to, to assess them, we look at the class of impairment, first of all, and that's determined by how many ADLs or activities of daily living are, 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 infect, are affected. And there we can, whether it's gonna be a class one, two, three, four, or five. Now, within each class, to determine, to determine the impairment percentage, whether it's, whether it's a low class one versus a high class one, or vice versa, depends on the frequency, intensity, the signs and symptoms, and the frequency and complexity of the medical treatment. And here's a table taken from the guides showing what activity the daily living look at from self care, communication, physical activity, sensory function, um, travel, sexual function, and sleep. It all we all know well. This is a picture which shows again, you can see a, there's a defect on the, on the right forearm. There's a contour defect. You can see the meshing of the skin graft. You can see there's, there, there's some sort of raised thickening and possible trophic changes of the graft. It, it, it potentially could affect the functionality of the wrist. And all of these factors need to be considered when we would assess the scar. Faces are slightly different. And again, um, there's some categories with the New South Wales guidelines, for example, we tend to use chapter six and table 6.1, but the AMA4 and AMA5 have their own um, tables as well. And this is um, an example for facial scarring where class one, class two, class three, class four, depending on, on whether that is re related to cutaneous structures, whether there's involvement of, su of supporting structures or whether there's a loss of, of a major tissue part such as a nose or eye depends on the actual class that they will fall in. So little points about this, the loss of supporting structures generally tends to, uh, such as the cheek, for example, a cheek fracture, where there'll be no scarring, but the depression will be 6% or more. Whereas a loss of an anatomic part can be 11% or total distortion up to 50%. WPI. And finally, um, just want to touch on the Temsky classification, which is the evaluation table for minor skin impairments, because there's a lot of variation between the, in, in a class one skin disorder from zero to nine percent. And this helps uh, identify things to look for. And just some points with the Temsky. If there's a contour defect, it's at least one percent or more, depending on how many scars and, and how visible whether there's a few ADLs at all, would score at least 2% or more. If there's any adherence of a scar, it at least puts that up into a 3%. And if there's limitations of activities of daily living and exposure to chemical or physical agents, such as sunlight, cause problems and you have to cover up, that would tend to score higher than 5% or more. And with that, I think I've come to the end of my talk. Um, wow. Can I say uh, I learned an incredible amount through that. Um, the skin is far, far more complex than I had any idea of. Um, I know that that will be incredibly valuable to our listeners because it does really talk about how the skin is classified, the proper terminology that should be used, which will, I know, no doubt inform um, our case managers and lawyers in writing their letters of instruction of how to classify things and when they're reading the reports and compiling a letter of instruction. Um, lots of really great comments have come through in the chat there, which is great. Um, everybody, thank you so much for your time. We're really grateful that you made the time. And once again, thank you again to Dr. Rajapaksi for making time for us. Thank you, sir. No problem. Thank you for having me. Great. Just stop the recording. Hang on a sec. Uh, hang on a sec. I've just got to um, claim host again. claim host. I am the host and now I can start recording. Great.